Most people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10, let alone 35. Cannabis truly is a pharmacy and a flower. Survival comes with cooperation. Pleasure is healing. You're being a warrior of the weird. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. There's always more you can do to live healthier, to have more energy, to feel better, to think clear, to live longer. The basic advice is a good diet and regular exercise. But when you get into the details of what exactly constitutes a good diet or the right kind of exercise, it gets complicated because our bodies are complicated. That's where Wade Lightheart comes in. As you'll hear, he started off as a scrawny kid in Canada with a dream. He dedicated his life to learning how to keep the human body functioning in top condition. He became a vegetarian bodybuilder who competed for Mr. Universe. Several life experiences, including a powerful near-death experience, left him determined to learn from the best, and eventually to share that wisdom with everyone else. He's in love with probiotics, enzymes, and a very active lifestyle. And when he tells his inspiring story, he's also telling the story of the human body. You can learn more at his site, biooptimizers.com, and you can get a free copy of his book where he shares more. Plus, if you use the coupon code THELEXFILES10, you can get 10% off any of the purchases you make there. Wade doesn't only understand the human body. He also understands the mental attitude required to overcome the bad health habits that modern life imposes on us. And his attitude is contagious. So if you want to learn how to actually live a healthier life from an impressive coach, then you'll benefit from this conversation with Wade Lightheart. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to have Wade Lightheart here today. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. And you're coming from sunny Venice Beach, California. You betcha. Good for you. And so you've been around the physical fitness world for a long time, a vegetarian competing for Mr. Universe levels of competition. And so I was curious, what first got you into physical fitness and paying attention to health? Well, number one, I grew up playing sports and athletics. I just loved playing. And, you know, I grew up where we organized our own baseball and played on pond hockey in Canada and capture the flag. So we spend a lot of time outdoors doing our own things and creating that. And so I've always, it's been part of my lifestyle for, since I can remember, but where it got into more of the fitness oriented or more, more as a career or more as a, a, a what I would say a, a systematized endeavor happened when I was 15, three events happened. Number one, we moved to a very rural place. It was five miles up a dirt road to my nearest neighbor. I lived in the woods, you know, I had to take a snowmobile to get out to the bus and an hour bus ride to get to school. So I was literally the guy that went uphill both ways um, <laughs> uh, in the in a winter time. So I was that guy and uh, like the telephone poles under my door. So I was in a very, I, I wasn't happy about that as beautiful as the place was because I was away from my friends and my environment and, and the things that are used to, but that po- forced me to be reflective and ref- and and forced me to understand what silence actually is because I was in the woods. You get to really know what that is. There's no input. There was no internet. There was no phones and texts and none of these things that we are subjected today, which creates a lot of noise in our awareness. Second thing that happened um, at at that time was my sister, who was four years my senior, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which is a form of cancer of the lymph nodes. And I watched her over the next four years go through the medical model before she died at the age of 22. And so having been... um, subjected to the realities that your life and your health isn't a guarantee at such a formative age made a very, very strong impression onto me. And so obviously not wanting to have the same recourse myself. Number one, I can remember thinking when we were coming home from, you know, she'd get her chemotherapy treatment and we'd have to maybe stop six, seven times on the way home for her to vomit. I remember thinking to myself in a naive way that like, Geez, man, it, it, it doesn't seem like they're getting healthier. The treatment seems worse than the situation. So what actually produces health? I didn't understand anything, but just it was obvious to me that something didn't make sense in this endeavor. And then at the same time, this is a very short period of time, my sister gave me a bodybuilding magazine, had Troy Zuclato, 
on the cover who just won Mr. California and two pretty girls in bikinis. And I was like, wow, maybe if I had those muscles, I could get those girls. And, and at, I made the connection that if you were strong, you were healthy. So if you had these muscles, you must be healthy. And the cover looked great and the people looked great. I was like, okay, this is what I need to do. So I built a gym in my barn and started training and discovered Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was the, the number one movie star at the time. He was a multiple Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympia winner. He was living the life in California. And, and um, he, in his book, Education of a Bodybuilder, he said, you can achieve anything you want in life if you're willing to put in hard work and have self-discipline and a positive attitude. Well, everybody I knew worked hard. We were, you know, people were working on the boats as fishermen. They were working in the lumber. They were working in mills. They were working in these very mechanic, like very hard, physically demanding jobs. So everybody worked hard, but this whole positive attitude and self-discipline, that was a unique idea. And so I embraced him as my ad hoc mentor. And with Arnold said it, I did it. And so that led me to a career. Uh, I went to university, studied exercise physiology and nutrition and then from there worked my way through every single aspect of the health and fitness industry from being in warehouses being a represented product a sponsored athlete owning my own uh, working in gyms and then uh, working in stores and then eventually being a personal trainer and then starting my my own company and then eventually creating my own products and education systems it seems like a really natural progression Yes, it's it, most people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10, let alone almost 35, which I've been at this now. And you've uh, said elsewhere about how you went traveling around the world looking for answers, that you were on the road a lot as a young person. What started you on that journey? Why did you think you need to go out and start seeking out masters? And how did that process go? How did you find the people you were looking for? Great question. So it, the, the, the TSN turning point, as they say, the TSN's a sports network in Canada, <laughs> just for reference. But the turning point was um, when I was in university, I had a friend who was a mega genius. He was a physicist by trade, ended up becoming the head physicist for the Gottlieb Space Center. And we were like Mutt and Jeff. And, and, and I had a penchant for physics. Most people didn't know this. So we became, we struck up a friendship over a ketchup bottle and how to get the ketchup out of the bottle by explaining physical principles. And him and I started to run all sorts of radical experiments. I'm being the jock. He's kind of like the tall, the spectacled geek. And, and, and but we, we, we were concerned about the ideas and, and thinking about things in ways that people weren't. So we wanted to kind of determine what was success and what did successful people do and how did you become the best that you could possibly do. And although he had far superior intellectual capabilities than, than myself. There was this, a lot of great exchange. And we started reading Think and Grow Rich, the book by Napoleon Hill. And as it turned out, when I was 22 years old, a, a couple of more crazy events happened. One was I had a near-death experience. And the near-death experience made university seem like kindergarten. And I had been frustrated with my university degree because it seemed like a lot of compartmentalized information, but not a unified aspect of how to achieve the things that I wanted to achieve. The second thing was that John and I, that was my friend, my friend John and I, we, we were trying to apply some of those principles to a variety of things. We started businesses, we started looking into real estate, we started trying to copy, we'd go down to the river and smoke cigars, thinking that's what rich people did and kind of contemplating things and reading these books. And, and what happened is I left university and went into a sales job and it was in a furniture store and I was working all these hours a week and I wasn't able to, to train the way I wanted to train with my bodybuilding career that had just gotten started a few years before. And, and I was frustrated and I remember waking up in my house in my little apartment that I had with my little car, a Toyota SR5. And I remember waking up and looking, my bed was in a way that I looked down the hallway and into the living room. And I realized it was like I saw a tunnel. And in that tunnel, I saw how my life was going to put out. And I was basically every, I was becoming everything that I said I wasn't going to be. And so I went to see my friend that day and I was like, dude, I, I, if I don't get out of this rut, I'm in a job that I hate. I'm, I'm not doing what I'm not. I'm not going for my dreams. I need to bust this now. And I had read this, the chapter in the book about Barnes 
the railway bum that laid it all on the line, took a train to get to Edison and took a job as a janitor with Edison in order to uh, eventually five years later, he got an opportunity to sell Edison's dictaphone. And I was like, you know what? I need to go like that. I need to burn the bridges, throw caution to the winds and go for it. So I literally got rid of everything in my life uh, in the course of uh, about 10 days, quit my job, sold everything I had, got on a plane, flew to my first plane ride to Vancouver, Canada, took a bus down to Seattle, took a train from Seattle to Los Angeles, and came out to uh, Venice Beach after staying a night at the Banana Bungalow in, in Hollywood as a 22-year-old with all these people from around the world that were staying in this hostile environment. And as a very sheltered kid in a lot of ways that had no business being in the world, it was a radical adventure. And I felt free and I loved interacting with all these people from around the planet. And I came down here and lo and behold, I met Joe Gold who was running world gym at the time. And he was like the icon. And, you know, I developed a little relationship with him over the course of a couple of weeks and he gave me some salient advice. And, um, and to this day that would be a big change in my life. And I, I, I pursued my career to its end. And here we are 33 years later, uh, doing the things that I dreamt of when I was 15 years old. Hold fast to the dreams of that youth. Yes. And chiller. And actually, could I go back and ask about the near-death experience? I've just been reading about so many recently, so it yes. caught my ear. So one of the areas that um, we began running experiments on was the infusion of psychedelic drugs in order to augment consciousness. And we, we had been studying consciousness and mental processes and stuff. And so John and I were doing systematic experiments uh, using things like LSD. And unfortunately, I got a batch that was cut with strychnine or something and had an overdose. Oh. And during that experience, I went through the death experience. And um, uh, it was extraordinarily transformational. Uh, I did the life review and felt all the emotions of the things of everybody that I'd caused problems with. And in the divinity of, of the light, when I was brought before divinity, and I was very clear that that's what it was, the source of all things, which was so powerful and bright, but not blinding and all encompassing and understanding. I can kind of go back there in my mind at any moment. And in the presence of that perfection, I didn't, I wasn't judged by anything outside of myself. I judged myself within that. And I felt this experience of self-loathing. And then from there, I went to a variety of upper levels of hell and went through multiple incarnations in my past and then ended up becoming reborn and woke up and like, okay. And for a couple of weeks, I was really messed up because I thought kind of I jumped out of this uh, quantum reality that in that life I actually expired, but somehow I jumped into as, as if reality is like a three-dimensional possibility matrix and we experience because we discount, we're conditioned so linearly, we discount anything that doesn't happen randomly, even though most of the big events that happen in our life are unpredictable moments. You know, meeting a person, having the, a birth of a kid, being in a car accident, getting a disease, you know, a, a business connection that happens randomly. We tend to discount those things in our conditioning of the Newtonian paradigm of causality. And so having jumped out of that reality into this other one, I was it was very discombobulating for a while, but as I accommodated, then I was like, okay, maybe life isn't, exa maybe everything that we've been told in life isn't actually the way it is. It's a conditioning to narrow our lenses and our possibilities. And so why not throw caution to the wind and embrace the possibility matrix and, and take what the world sees as radical risks? Because I felt that, you know, the end was guaranteed. We all are going to die. We are going to leave this plane the question was, how was I going to live? And having the experience of my sister going through that the death experience and all that uh, earlier on and knowing how what she would do to get another day, I determined that the best thing I could do was to honor that in my own experience with her and with my near-death experience to, to embrace living life to its absolute fullest. Not as a cool meme that you throw on social media, but actually doing that. And that has its own consequences, and it's not for everybody, but it was the one that I most resonated with, the idea. Thank you for sharing. Uh, it, it really resonates, especially 
I keep reading about how important and hard integration can be after those experiences because they don't fit into a medical model. I mean, what happened to you was just, you know, you could be completely brain dead and they're like, oh, it just happened in your brain. Correct. And it's more real than this life. That's the other part. That's the other, imp the impression is so intense that once you've had one of those experiences, um, you don't like, I didn't know anything about reincarnation. I heard stuff in my religious stuff, which I had abandoned because I didn't like organized religion at the time. And then all of a sudden afterwards, then things started to make a lot more sense. I got into Eastern philosophy. I still got into meditation. I started, and I, I still made lots of mistakes. Don't get me wrong, but I didn't have to operate from a position of faith. And that put me into a disproportionate amount of good fortune for me in the aspect that when I read about things or I hear about things that sound kind of woo woo or out there, having experience those things in my own life alerts to a greater or lesser extent, it's much easier to extrapolate than it is for someone who, who has only lived here in the, you know, the, the physical realm with all its conditioning parameters that's put upon us by society. Exactly. Yeah. I feel very lucky that I happen to be in an age when psychedelics are fairly accessible because otherwise I would absolutely be a materialistic scientist and I didn't have a, mm -hmm. an experience like yours through disease or something like that. And so it sounds very powerful that you did and you got a chance to integrate it and really make it better and sounds like still resonates through everything you do. hundred percent. It's uh, been the guiding course of my uh, existence ever since. To get back to the, the health side, what was going through your head then as you were starting your first gym, which sounds like that probably would have been one of the big leaps. You're see sinking money into a business and hoping it's going to work. Well, there were stages. So my first gym I built was in my barn. So it was a gym for me, by me, and was involved like tractor tires, sawhorses, uh, makeshift pulleys and cables and um, that sort of thing that I, that I invented and built myself. So I think what the value of that was and what the value I think of progressive resistance training is, is there was a lot of things going on in my time that I didn't have control over. And what working out gave me is that I could set forth a course of action and imply a number of different strategies. And I could see first, I would feel muscle soreness on different muscle groups, or I'd get tired of these things. But then I would see that there was progression, I would get stronger, and then my muscles would look a little different. And, and, and so what I began to recognize is that I had built in an accountability. And I had, I had found that even in a world that I couldn't control much of, I had something that I could put my own energy and direction into and see a result. And I think whatever it is for people to understand the agent of progression through uh, intention combined with action. And I didn't have all that languaging at the time, but that was transformative for me. And then also, you know, marrying that to a grand vision. And even though I hadn't competed in the Mr. Universe contest, I saw someone that had done it and I was following the principles that they advocate. So mentorship even though I wasn't directly interacting with Arnold Schwarzenegger, I was interacting with the principles he espoused through the book, through the writings, and through engaging in these workouts, and then wanting to learn more by increasing my education and my understanding and the nuances within that through my education, and so on and so forth, which continues on to this day, because the principles of skill acquisition and self-improvement are universal. They're universally applicable to every single field. So for me, it just happened to be fitness. Now, when we got into, you know, my first business, I think really I, I worked for a number of businesses to learn some mechanics and where I might fit in and where I didn't. But in 1998 of when I went to my first national championship and went out to the West Coast, I, I, I took on a personal training position. And that was my first kind of like, I'm, I'm running the show here. Uh, and, and that was great. And then the second thing, I opened up my juice bar, which because I didn't know anybody and I thought that'd be a great place to meet people and connect. And I, I, I made a deal and it was, you know, I took a chance and went on that and had a partner and ended up buying him out and went through all those little nuances experience. And it was a struggle. It was tough. I didn't know what I was doing. I made all kinds of mistakes. But again, just like when I was training, it was like, okay, this is a progressive process you know, and, um, and it's, it's continued on since that moment. I mean, things obviously changed in 04 when I partnered up with Matt, my current business partner. And that was a big thing because he, he knew the principles of marketing, which I was completely ignorant to and often against. 
yeah, that often, it seems like it often happens. The marketing can be the toughest part. One thing I wanted to ask about, though, through your early training, how did you start to shift your relationship with food as you were trying to tune your body? The first thing was I started to learn about how to repair and recover, recover from what I would say, you know, intensive workouts. And so what that means now at that time, it was like, okay, just make sure you get enough protein and you eat multiple times a day because you needed to get bigger. And I was a scrawny kid. So I had to like figure out how I, I, I needed to make, I need to make systematized nutrition, uh, the approach that I couldn't just eat what tasted good. And, and there was a, and there was an aha moment. This is a, I, I never shared this. I said, asking some good questions. Uh, I had been doing this for a while and getting my mom to kind of get the food that I wanted. And, and even though it was still rudimentary, it was, it was an improvement. But when I went to university, uh, my second year is when John and I became friends, the physicist. And w we were going through, we were, we were in residence and we'd go to the, the residence cafeteria and, and I'm selecting food based on its nutrition of value, calories, protein, carbohydrate. Like I had learned all this stuff and I'm selecting my, and then, and then I watched him, we were kind of going and, and he's just picking things. And so I asked him, I said, John, I'm just curious, what is the parameters you're using to choose your food? He goes, I don't know, just what tastes good. And I thought, wow, here's a guy that is one of the most intellectually superior people I've ever met in my life. The guy is a mega genius, worked with NAS, like, you know, like everything he just learned and instantly. And he's not applying himself in this food thing, because he's, he's never thought about it. And I was like, that was like an aha moment, because you don't know what you don't know, you, you, and, and your assumptions can kill you. And so for me, it was like, I became fascinated with how nutrition could show up with my physique. And, and then it went to the next level when I dieted for my first competition, which was a complete reversal of the principles that I had to try and get bigger then I was able to achieve that. And then I was like, oh, nutrition changes everything, not just for gaining weight, but for losing body fat. And that became another fascinating awareness breakthrough. So what advice would you have for people listening who just want to be eating better to keep themselves fit, who might be trying to exercise more, or in my sake, who's trying to get my runs to be longer than my showers? Co correct. Well, first and foremost, you need outside authority if you're going to, if you're going to main change. If I would take the thousands and thousands and thousands of people I've coached throughout the years, people struggle and certainly do not achieve their maximum capabilities if they don't have professional guidance. And Professional guidance means that someone who is able to repeatedly produce the result that you desire across the board uh, for a, a, a group segment of people, and you are going to pay for that expertise. But what I would say is it's a bargain compared to paying for it the old fashioned hit and miss trial because you know, I thought I could do it all through books and education and all that sort of stuff. And I had a certain level of success. But when I hired my first coach on bodybuilding in 1997, I made more progress from 97 to 98 in literally nine and a half months than I had made on any given point in the last 10 years before. Now, had I applied that early on in my career, I would have improved the trajectory of my life. And that's been the same thing, whatever area that I want to learn, I get someone who's producing that results and I have an accountability system built in with that person. If, I, if I'm not measuring, if I don't have accountability built into that process, whether that's the scales, the body fat percentage, the weight training tracking and the dietary tracking, I'm not going to make it, and I'll tell you why. The human organism is built on efficiency in the preservation of energy. And it's also predicated on survival mechanisms that were based on we don't have enough food to survive. So in order to optimize one's health and fitness in a highly technological world where empty calories are everywhere, 
And we have these biological mechanisms to preserve energy and these biological mechanisms to eat as many calories as possible and to move as little as possible in order to acquire them because that meant survival in, for, for millions of years of, of, of evolution. We have to recognize that we have become so technologically advanced is these energy efficiency systems within our own nervous system will actually kill us because of the technological advantages which we haven't adapted to, to, towards. So we've now become the Darwinian influence on our own of evolution. And if you don't make it, uh, if you don't make these adaptations to the technical water, you and your offspring are going to be subjected to horrific levels of suffering and early demise. That's a proven fact. Heavy. It, it's, it's, and people don't like hearing that stuff, but it, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine in the, in the, in the late, in the early 2000s reported, or Professor Oshansky reported, reported that for two things that were very radical. Number one, the disability adjusted life expectancy in the United States became 60 years old. That means for the next 20 years, a quarter of your life, you would be on some form of um, compromised living through medical intervention. And the second thing that he said in that is that the children, for the first time in history, uh, in, in the United States history, were life expectancy was lower than that of their parents. And there was a lot of conjecture. A lot of people were upset at that. But over the last few years, thanks to the opioid crisis in the United States, that's actually true now. The, 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 the life expectancy is starting to, to go down in the United States, not to mention the quality of life. Uh, and I think that's radically been accelerated under the current situations. If you look at the number one comorbidity, the two comorbidity facts are obesity and vitamin D levels are the two number one comorbidity facts. So where do you get vitamin D? You get vitamin D by being out in the sun and making sure you take your vitamin D. And number two is that you manage your weight and the average weight gain during this whole thing has been 30 pounds. So staying inside and gaining weight is the absolute opposite thing that you need to support your immune system in order to put yourself in the survival mechanism. So what's being propagated out in the world as the, the methodology to do is absolutely false and absolutely uh, not in alignment with the basic function of our own immune systems. And so if you're living in a world of such public disinformation without the guidance of an expert, an expert who's been there and done that and followed that, you are going to fall to commonality thinking. And what I would suggest is the data supports that if you follow the herd, you will live a life like the herd. And that doesn't look too appealing to me. So find expertise. Yes. And focus on, on health. What's amazing is how often I hear of people's lives being changed by taking 5 or 10 milligrams of CBD every day. That's such a small amount. And yet for so many, that's their sweet spot. 5 milligrams in the morning, 5 milligrams in the evening. So while our first advice on CBD is always start low, go slow. For some people, they soon realize that 20 or 30 milligrams of CBD a day isn't getting them the health outcomes they're looking for. We know that you can benefit from higher levels of CBD. So it makes sense to have a supplement where you can take one capsule with 50 milligrams. That's why we created our Maximum Strength Soft Gels. Each one contains 50 milligrams of CBD, plus everything else that you love from a full spectrum hemp extract. The other cannabinoids, the terpenes that enhance the entourage effect, and the rich fatty acids that are used by the plant to make its cannabinoids and used by our brains and bodies to make our own endocannabinoids. That's all the pieces of the plant working together for good, helping to enhance the effects of that 50 milligrams of CBD. We created it because people needed it. So always start low and go slow, but don't be afraid to go high and fly. Use a coupon code LEXFILES at pluscbdoil.com for 25% off our maximum strength CBD soft gels. And, and build in that accountability system with the expertise so that that person's going to hold you to a standard that you might not have for yourself or want for yourself, but don't know how to maintain. And this would be unpopular, um, a certain Very parts popular. of it. And it was something I was curious about is as you're in the bodybuilding world, what was it like to be a vegetarian, uh, a public, you know, quite a quite vocal uh, vegetarian while competing at these high levels of bodybuilding? Was there pushback or oh, yeah. annoyance at that? <laughs> hundred percent. So let's, let's go back. So in 1998, I left the sport after the national championship because I felt that 
at that time we were transiting from Dorian Yates to Ronnie Coleman. And I realized in order to get to the top ranks of the sport, I was going to have to uh, engage in using prodigious amounts of drugs with no guarantee of success. And the consequences from a health perspective would, the risk was certainly increasing exponentially the further up the ladder that you went. And that, that became unacceptable to me because that was not what I got involved with the sport. So I went off and did my thing. And then I got into really into meditation and read a book called The Holy Science, uh, which was a book that was talking about uh, where you are in the universe and the right choice of vocation and life and what's the purpose. And it was a really, really great book. And so what it was like, it would be advantageous to be on a plant-based diet for meditation. And I was like, well, that seems pretty great, pretty radical, but it was very different. So I decided I would do a two-week experiment. And I said, I'll try it without for two weeks. And then I said, I didn't dry up and blow away. So I went two weeks more. And then after a month, I said, I'll do another month. And it was so then two months went by and I said, I guess I won't eat meat anymore. And I haven't said it. it's been 20 years. Now, then I was as a, my meditation was going, it said, if something doesn't exist for you, it's never been created before, but it's right and in alignment with the divine plan, it'll be created for you. And I'm like, well, that's a pretty bold statement from my spiritual teacher. Fair enough. I'm going to, I've always wanted to compete at the Mr. Universe. That was my 15 year old dream. I wanted to be in the Mr. Universe. I wanted to have a supplement company that helped people around the world. And I wanted to live in Venice Beach, California. Those are those goals. I said, I'm not there yet. Drug tested competitions came into vogue at that time. And so I said, I'm going to compete in a drug tested competition and I'm going to do it on a plant-based diet. No one's ever done that before. So let's try it. What do I got to lose? And so I did it. And my coach, my coach who had coached me prior, I hired him again to kind of help me go through this process. He goes, Wade, like you're, 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 you're playing the sport with one arm tied behind your back. Why are you going to do this? And I said, well, because I want to see if it can be done. We don't know unless we try. So I went through that process and we made lots of mistakes, but here's the beauty of it. So, and I remember, you know, I had a conversation with them going to the national championships or the world championships when I was preparing that year. And he said, Wade, you know, your competitors are going to be using drugs. We can mask the drugs and this will give you a shot at victory, a shot to win the Mr. Universe. And I said, no, that's against my values and processes. He says, well, you have no hope of winning. I said, I understand that, but I need to take the integrous action, regardless if anybody knows about it. I know about it and that's all that matters. And so I went to the world championships, placed 13th, got wiped out like everybody else. It was a great experiment. And after the contest, I had met some boys that couldn't go to the show and I began teaching them. I went and did a seminar out of the course. And I realized that my passion was actually not to be Mr. Universe, was actually to teach other people the principles of health and fitness. This happened at the Mr. Universe in Mumbai, India. Now, I had done some things wrong and my, I blew up afterwards. I gained 42 pounds of fat and water after the contest because I've been on a contest diet literally for 11 straight months destroyed my metabolism, was trying to do it as a plant-based guy, gained all this weight. And so now everyone's like, oh, I told you so. Look at that. You tried to do it as a plant-based. Now you went from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow. It's a total disaster. I've been putting 16 years in it. I had the best coach. I got Spartan discipline and it all goes to hell in a handbasket. And I'm like, man. And again, fortune smiled upon me. And I met a doctor and this doctor had been famous for healing Bernard Jensen when he got cancer. He had repaired cirrhosis of the liver in himself and colon cancer in myself. And I met him and he gave this beautiful lecture for all day long. And he was the most vibrant senior citizen I'd ever seen. He looked right through and he had glowing skin. He was strong and he did the whole seminar. He never ate anything and he was so lively. And I was like, dude, this, I need to know what this guy, he's like everything I want to be as a senior citizen. And I went to him, I said, Dr. O'Brien, what have I done wrong? I don't get it. I've, I've done all these things. I got the training, I got the discipline, I got the attitude, I followed everything, and now I'm a physical wreck. And he's like, Wade, you've learned to build the body from the outside in. I'm going to teach you how to build the body from the inside out. And I followed his principles. I took all these nutritional supplements. I learned about enzymes and the digestive system and probiotics and remineralization and, and plant-based amino acid uh, compositions and the right essential fatty acids to offset the limitations of the diet and how to clean out the gunk inside my intestines with herbs and how to wipe out parasites and other bacteria. And I applied it all. And in six months, I got my physique back. I got my health to a level I never experienced before. I was super vibrant. And during that time, Matt and I started what originally now is known as Bioptimizers at that time. So 
I followed the course. I didn't get the win that I thought, but then I discovered the principles, the, the true inner principles of health. And then a business came out of it uh, as well because I followed through on what was right for me, not what was right for the world. And, and uh, we've met a lot of conjecture and problems. And, and then uh, over the course of the next four years, I perfected it coaching 15,000 people and went and did another con contest. I came back, won the world, a couple national championships, went to the worlds again, placed fifth, but I had mastered the principle. So I did better, felt better, didn't have the, the weight gain after. And at that point, we started advocating this en masse to, to regular people. That's great. And that was going to be the next set of questions is those kind of practical en masse advice. But the one thing I wanted to go back to that you said at the very beginning about muscles equaling more health. And after all of that, no. do you... Is that true? No. So there's three areas where people get attracted into the fitness industry or the health industry or the nutrition industry. Aesthetics, performance, or health. Number one, most people are attracted, especially in the early days, they want to look better. Maybe it's they got a wedding to go to. Maybe it's a family reunion. Maybe they just saw a picture of them and they went, oh my God, I don't want to look like that anymore. I, I, I want to look a certain way. Okay. The other side of it is I can't do the things I want to do. I, you know, I can't hang out with my kids and play with them the way I want. Maybe I'm struggling with work or, or whatever, or I, I, I need to be able to push further and I, I need to get my brain operating, or whatever it happens to be. It's usually some performance mechanism that you want to be able to do, or maybe you want to go run a marathon or you want to go in your first fitness competition, whatever. So it's a performance-based attraction. But at the end of the day, we all go to the last part of the equation, which I call the base of the pyramid, which is health. We want to be able to do the things that we want to do for as long as possible. And as human, the human organism kind of peaks in its early 20s and then is on a, a, a rapid or slow descent downwards in virtually every single category that you can go in. Yet through the intervention of uh, good health pr principles and practices, one can oftentimes extend the top of the arc of physical potential and vitality, and then also diminish the level of decline. And I just saw some research the other day that people who strength train, the average 80-year-old is stronger than the average 29-year-old uh, if they continue on with their resistance training over that time. That's a pretty compelling picture of because because the loss of strength is what causes the loss of mobility and for longevity and so while there was a little bit of a truth that i was looking the external look and this is a mistake that people make people think hey if i'm an athlete if i if i got you know six percent body fat or i can run a marathon or i can you know run through a line of scrimmage really fast or i can pole vault or i can you know jump uh, or, or do these kind of performance based things related to fitness or aesthetics they assume that they're healthy even though many of those people that we put in those categories are using all sorts of drugs or live in sort of destructive or very narrow environments in order to perform very high here but they're suffering in all these other areas of life that are not um, part and parcel to the regular world. And I would say high performance athletics is not healthy. You need to be very fit and muscularity in certain areas, in certain sports or certain from an aesthetically appealing level. There's a certain degree of muscularity, which is appealing to a popula pop the population. And then there's probably a point where it becomes unappealing. And um, everybody kind of finds their happy medium in there. How do enzymes play into this and play into health? Yes. So enzymes are catalysts inside the body. They are the difference between stone plants and people. They are what separates the living from the dead. Our ability to catalyze various metabolic processes inside the body. And so the average human has over 25,000 enzymatic activities. And when I was first engaged in the bodybuilding world and stuff, I, what I didn't know is that you have a limited supply of these enzymes. And there's a guy by the name of Dr. Edward Howe who wrote Food Enzymes for Health and Longevity and Enzyme Nutrition, who had done all these research back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s on animals that eat ate an enzymatically deficient diet. So every species on the planet eats its food in a raw live state and acquires the enzymes of that organism. So a, a tiger takes down a zebra, it eats the entrails 
first where the enzymes and probiotics are, that helps it digest the carcass and then it eats the carcass. A bear eats a salmon that's jumping out of the river, you know, the most vibrant ones, or it eats the freshest blueberries that are out there. And a cow or a horse will go pick the, the enzymatically rich sprouts from the grass. And they all have concordantly the bacteria that's associated with that, that helps in its breakdown and digestion of those components. It's, it's, it's ubiquitous within the food supply of every single species. But humans, in our technological innovation, we learn to cook our food. And there's advantages to cooking our food. It provides more calories. It allows ability to store. However, it causes, we have to use smooth and striated muscle to convert into enzymes to produce those enzymes. There's a huge metabolic cost. That's why you feel so tired after Thanksgiving dinner. Right? You eat all this food, you have all these calories, but your ability to convert those calories into building blocks or energy units is compromised. And so all the blood goes out of your brain and all the other organs and you pass out on the couch as your body's trying to break down and digest and assimilate this food. Well, we got into this whole case of irradiating uh, all the bad bacteria, all the, 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 the viruses out there, all the bacteria strains out there, uh, all the essential organisms for our soil. And we started to cook our food, uh, irradiate our food, and all of that destroys the enzymes and probiotics that are naturally inherent in our food supply. So as humans, we're operating on a very deficient enzyme and probiotic level, which are essential components of the digestive process. And we live in a symbiotic relationship with bacteria. Without bacteria, we would all die. We have, you know, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 strains inside your intestinal tract at any time. 10% good, 10% bad, 80% opportunist based on your lifestyle, your diet, your genetics, and what's going to fit. And if we're eating our food and, and there's an improper aspect of that conversion, we either don't have the bacteria present, the enzymes present, there are agents that we can't break down. All of those things then become potential contaminants that causes leaky gut, causes a contaminants to go into the system, cause our immune system response, inflammatory response. And then from inflammatory response, we get into de de degeneration, whether that is the sclerosis from the, the, the impact of sugar building up plaque inside the system, whether it is undigested of preservatives and dyes, which gets lodged into our essential organs and, make, and causing disruption in them, whether it is plastics or whether it is genetically modified food that our body can't break down, all of these things are now what we classify as food, which aren't really food mechanisms at all, not to mention the, uh, the ad hoc thousands of chemicals that are now associated with our food or processing or cooking and our delivery and presentation of the food. So we're living in a world where we haven't properly defined what food is. And because of that lack of clarity in our definitions, the, the end user has no hope. And I'm, and I'm, I'm clear about that has no possibility of getting it right unless, number one, they're highly intuitive and are willing to restrict themselves from the world as it, as it is, or you're living a monastic type lifestyle, or two, you will make serious calculations because it's just easier to go along with the herd. And I'm not against either one of those, but without clear guidance about how to you know, optimize your life to find the happy medium within where you are in your health journey, you're going to run into troubles. So how do we eat enzymatically? Yeah. So raw live food is the best source of enzymatically rich food. So fermented foods uh, have been used in every single culture in history to provide bacteria and enzymes. The challenge is it's extremely inconvenient. I did a raw food diet for two years. I only ate raw food and never any cooked food for two years. I felt amazing. I was super highly sensitized and aware with my, uh, all my sensory components. And I was a social reject because, you know, all the social components around food. And so what I did is I began using enzymes and probiotics to take with prior to my cooked food so that I was adding these elements in to aid in the digestive process and the assimilation process to convert to energy and building blocks and also to reduce the chance of anything being a contaminant. And so that's how I got around it because I realized that that's been stripped out of the food. So if I reintroduced this into my diet, well, then I wouldn't put the drain on the system and I would have less of a chance to having all the compromisations that uh, plague the population today. And the other thing for supplementing besides probiotics that we always talk about is vitamins and supplements. Yeah. Are there any that you always have at the top of your list for enhancing health that are worth buying to have every yeah. day? 
Yeah. So um, we produce a product called Primergen, which is uh, vitamins and minerals, uh, which is a whole host of trace minerals and all your essential vitamins and stuff that I do in a liquid component. I take that every single day. I also bolster my diet with magnesium. Um, I suggest people do a spectra cell test. And a spectra cell test is the state of the art test that will determine not just the nutrition levels in your blood, which is what most blood tests do, but will actually show what actually gets in your cells. And this way you can determine what nutrients that you absorb easily and what ones you don't absorb easily, as well as what might be missing currently. So you get specifics that like, for example, most people, if you're in a North American culture, you're deficient in magnesium, about 80% of the population. Just right off the bat, there's just not enough in their soils. And that is a very, very critical element. Most vegetarians are limited in B12 because animal-based products, we usually get B12 from bacteria production uh, inside our intestinal tracts, but this doesn't happen with most animals. So they substitute animals, they inject animals with B12 shots. And so people who are eating animal products get B12 because they're getting the injections that were given to the animals because they know it makes the animals healthier. <laughs> so it's not, and so, but as a plant-based guy, you don't have access to that. You're not, you're not getting the extraneous B12 that's been injected into the animals. So you need to make sure that you have, uh, you're able to produce B12. Um, essential fatty acids as a vegetarian, I need to be more conscientious of making sure that I get the omega threes and things like that inside my diet, dietary practice. So if you're on any diet, keto, paleo, plant, by the way, I'm, I'm not a vigilante ve vegan or anything like that. I just choose a diet that's right for you, but you want to recognize that there's strengths and advantages to each diet. And there's weaknesses. And oftentimes the weaknesses don't show up because you get the initial benefits and you kind of run on that. And then, and then the weaknesses within that diet might not show up to a year, two years, three years down the road. And so through testing, you can get out of the realm of conjecture and know precisely where you are in that and then just top up. And it's very, very affordable. So SpectraCell will cost you 500 bucks, but it'll probably save you tens of, th tens of thousands of dollars down the road in nutritional supplements because you can target your supplements and you just do a test every few years and see where you're at and then you adjust accordingly as opposed to randomly shotgunning whatever you heard on MSN news. And so you this this area is plagued too by just the individuality of humans and what your own body absorbs. Yeah, I mean I mean this is one of my big issues with peer reviewed journals. Uh, if you look at peer reviewed studies, oftentimes the context uh, of the sample group is we don't know for their genetic and epigenetical variances within that test. And we also don't know what happens over the, say, the course of maybe years. So very few studies, I would say, implement meta-analysis type of um, diagnosis. In other words, it'll show you a little slice and there's value in that. But without the meta-analysis to see how this works over large segments of the population with all the individual genetic and epigenetical variances, um, I think can lead people to wrong conclusions and can also lead unscrupulous people to accentuate research that demonstrates that their product or service is, is, is going to be the right one because they, they're gonna cherry pick the studies that they select. And so this is commonplace in virtually every field, uh, medicine and nutrition, where people cherry pick the results that kind of allow people to say, you know what, there's peer reviewed journals behind this that have suggested this is the right course of action. And the reality is, is no, I, I learned this my first year of university going to the, the library. And I remember doing, it was a, it was a research paper on uh, vitamin B, I, the vitamin B family. And I was finding like half the research suggested that supplementing with B complex B vitamins was advantageous and half of them was saying there was no advantage. So I could just cite whichever side of the paper and I brought it up to my professor. I'm like, how the heck are we supposed to know which is the truth? How do we do this? And I didn't understand meta-analysis at the time and I got a very cookie cutter thing. Well, just select the research that supports your hypothesis. And I'm like, well, isn't that like, isn't, aren't you supposed to start with the hypothesis and the scientific method and then find like chip away to prove that it doesn't exist? Isn't that the, like, so we're just self-selecting so I could get an A here on the course. And that is permeated through the entire, uh, I would say authoritative based institutions 
which people are making their choices around health harm. Like, go to any hospital in the world, and the food that they're serving to the patients who are recovering from a condition makes no nutritional sense at all. There's no science applied to that. And I go, well, you're here in this supposedly well-researched scientific institution, and you're feeding people recovering from a serious illness like jello come on man yeah it, it's hard to watch and it's i mean and you know in in defense of the scientists nutrition is one of the hardest things to study because people are so individual but on the flip side of the coin as someone who has watched who, who loves science and has watched its corruption in various fields you arguably nutrition is one of the very first fields that was polluted by industrial science coming in and changing uh, things in their own interest. And, you know, there's been great books written about it and it is hard to, to know. Cause you know, what, like you said, what are the answers? They can be in any direction that you feel like you want to prove and it must make it hard. And I wanted to ask you if there are any thinkers or books that you would recommend that helped you a lot that you think is someone who's solid. Yeah, I, I think Food Enzymes for Health and Longevity is a very compelling book for people to get into or Enzyme Nutrition, which is kind of like the shortened version of it, um, where it shows what happens over species, over multiple generations that are fe fed enzymatically deficient diets. Three things develop. They, they, they uh, have strange sociological behavior not natural to their, their species. They start to develop uh, a massive amounts of genetic-based illnesses, and they lose the ability to procreate. And he predicted that would happen after the, 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 after the 1940s when we changed the food production and delivery system. And so these are the unintended consequences of technological innovation. We went to, you know, the, ba the nuclear bombs were dropped. Um, people, technological explosion from the war made communication, transportation, and distribution different. Government said, how are we going to deal with all these new baby boomers that are exploding and living in cities? We're not producing in farms. We need to have monoculture farming and agricultural boards and to regulate the production of food and distribution of food. And then slowly but surely, some of the, what started out as good intentions. And so I'm not saying that there's some grandiose, evil, malevolent plan, but if we don't know how food was produced 80 years ago, which the average person doesn't, the average person doesn't know how to grow a carrot or how a potato is growing or, or how chickens might be raised. Most people think that egg yolks are naturally yellow, but if you've been on a farm or with hands out there, they're kind of orangey, right? But it's become acceptable that they're kind of yellow, but no, that's actually farm based. Like, so, and, and, and you know, and, and if you've had vegetables from a Mennonite farm using uh, heirloom seeds of 300 years compared to a genetically modified tomato somewhere else, you can tell that those two tomatoes don't taste the same way at any level, at any point, they, they, like, they're completely different foods. And so un unless we're able to look at wide scope accounting and because I was just simply ran into these problems in my own endeavors, like I made all the mistakes, I made all the failings, I had all the chance, like, you know, it's not like I, I was some genius that figured it out. So I would say um, it was the gradual insertion of that, but where the big jumps were, Physical fitness, when I hired my coach, Scott Abel, that was able to, to produce champions. Next intervention, when I ran into a health problems because of my fitness endeavors, I found an expert who was an expert in health. And from there, now I knew health and now I knew fitness. Okay, so how do I now create a third branch is where you have all of those composed. And that's where I came up with the awesome health formula which is the compilation of literally 30 plus years that, to look at what is the overarching philosophical system that a person can start with that you can apply whatever time, energy, and resources to create like awesome health to become biologically optimized. And that's a combination of practices, principles, first principles, how cells work, what are the things that optimize it, and then moving into uh, dietary practices, personalized assessments, and then optimizing all of those. And that's what I'm so, you know, that's why I love the, the biological optimization industry, which I'm in, is because now individuals can dive in and get specifics on them. The only thing that matters, the N of one. And where can people find your work yeah. that you're talking about? Yeah, well, they can just go to buy optimizers and download the awesome health course. And a lot of people say, hey, Wade, you got supplements for sale. You got this. Yeah, I do. But you can't supplement your way out of a bad diet or a bad lifestyle. And I spent my entire life trying to figure out 
the principles of how you produce health, high performance, and aesthetics. And I put those down so that people can follow that course. And I give the course away. So you can get it on bioptimizer.com or Facebook or Instagram. You can kind of go in. We have an app and all that sort of stuff. And you get all these coaching programs from me. And I would encourage people. That's where you start. You don't have to start with supplements or things like that. You need to get the first principles. You need to get air, water, and exercise down first. Those are non-negotiables. And so two last questions for you. Yeah. One is, so what does your health routine look like right now after all of these years of optimizing? One caveat, I do a variety of experiments that I'm not necessarily advocating and recommending for everybody. I think that you have to operate within your own parameters and your own level of expertise and also to get the most out of what you want. So following everything I do or experimenting with everything I do is not necessarily the right course of action before you apply the principles that I advocate. That's, that's, that, that's what I would start with. But um, fasting at least once a week. So one day, no food. That's a, you know, if the one thing that we found from a longevity perspective in reducing senescent cells, the cells that end up killing us, is that eating less is superior than eating more. That's the big thing. So I fast once a week. Um, I engage in physical exercise every single day. I engage in a deep, conscientious breathing practice where I engage in meditation process. I drink a minimum of four liters of ionized, alkalized water. Uh, from a machine that reduces all, first I do pre-filtration to reduce all the toxic chemicals that are in our industrialized water supply, which is great in the industrialized world, but we have to remove the chemicals that we, we out of that. And then I ionize it to cure of all antioxidants. I jump on my rebounder every morning because that's the best way to detoxify the lymph lymphatic system. Um, I take my enzymes. Uh, what's, what's a rebounder? Uh, it's a mini trampoline. And so I have a little mini trampoline. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I, I, by the way, I outline all this in the course so people can, you know, get all this stuff. You can, you can learn, you can do it all in 15 minutes. So get up in the morning. I get up in the morning. I gun down a liter of water with my vitamins and minerals. I jump on my mini trampoline, deep breathing and pu putting as much oxygen and removing as much carbon waste out of it. I get, I get done that. And I have a big uh, shake that has all my essential fatty acids, my amino acids, uh, fruits, phytonutrients, vegetables, supplements, all that stuff. I do that. I have a big salad at lunch and then whatever you want in the evening. If you do those three things, you're going to be great. I work out resistance training about five days a week to keep up the muscle mass, see a chiropractor in order to keep my spine and my nervous system functioning properly. And I do a barrage of tests to regulate everything from blood sugar, uh, unfolded proteins in the body, um, to see if I have any toxic chemicals that might be thing, heavy metal tests, all these sort of things to run other parameters that will take you out of the game. And so by engaging that, and so I'm pretty sophisticated 30 years down the road, but for the average person, you can, if you just do the 15 minute a day routine that I put in, you, your, your health is going to go to turbocharge in no time. That's great. That's inspiring. Got one kid, another on the way. I want to be optim. I want to be good enough. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so the last question is how mind plays into this for you. You mentioned meditation earlier and how this helps spark so much of this. How is your mind interacting with your body? Great question. So, so the awesome health formula is the acronym is air, water, exercise, sunlight, optimizers, mental beliefs and attitude, education, testing, and coaching. Those are the seven parameters and pillars. You could put mind first, but then it would screw up the acronym. You can have a great attitude and get away with a lot. You can have a lousy attitude and do everything right and it'll take you out. The importance of your mind, your intention cannot be understated because it's kind of like where you set the course of your life, the directional aspect. You can't always select what might be the obstacles, but your good intentions will definitely direct you on the path of if, then if you don't. You will not get super healthy and live a long time by accident. You will have an increased likelihood of getting there through intentions. And when I use mind, I believe it as a combination of beliefs and attitudes. What is your beliefs about health? And so for me, 
meeting my coach who had radical levels of, of muscularity or meeting Arnold Schwarzenegger through the books so that that was possible. Meeting my, my mentor as a, 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 a 70 year old man in his mid seventies in this ultra state of vibrant health set the course of what was possible for me. So I think inspiration through people who have achieved outrageous levels of performance in a given area, I think is a big part of, of resetting the belief potential. And then cultivating an attitude of positivity is what Arnold Schwarzenegger said is about taking positive steps like, yes, I can do that too. To, to move, instead of being a victim of your circumstances, to see that your circumstances are invitations by divinity to move towards your good intentions. And so oftentimes we don't get motivated until we're put up against it a little bit because that's when we'll dig down and see what we're really capable of. And I think there's something to be said about the adventure of our lives. You know what? It's, it, it, we're all going to suffer. We're all going to take hits. Why not do it in pursuit of that which is noble and good as opposed to just kind of niggling and complaining and whining your way into a, a horrible state of demise? I can't control how long I'm going to live. I can't control the moments that I have, but I can control my attitude. And I believe, I believe that if I engage in these practices, I can achieve a higher level of health. And I believe the belief in the practices is every bit as much as the practices themselves. Thank you for that. That's inspiring. I'll do a little bit more running and a little bit better eating, at least, thanks to this show. Well, Wade, thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us. We'll have a link to BioOptimizers in the episode notes, as well as the coupon code LexFiles, which gives, uh, I believe, 10% off, which was very kind. And so I just wanted to say thanks so much for sharing your wisdom about health and fitness today. You know, it's my pleasure. I love doing this. Uh, it was my dream as that 15-year-old boy. And, you know, um, I get to live this every day. I get to meet people like yourself. Uh, and share the things that I've learned and help people avoid the mistakes that I made. And now I live in a world that, that all the testing and ability to find out the things that I couldn't know in the past are now readily available and accessible. And the more that I can make that as continue on with my mission, um, it's just an awesome thing to be. So I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Live in the dream in Venice Beach. Till next time. Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, check out pluscbdoil.com, listen on all the podcast platforms, or see us on YouTube. Subscribe to the CV Sciences YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com, and please follow the podcast on Twitter at The LexFiles Show, where I try to keep it fun. If you enjoyed this program, please give us a like on your favorite platform or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne. The YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek. Thank you to Tina Molnar and Jasmine Morris for the visuals. And the music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. Our sponsor is CV Sciences, makers of America's favorite CBD oil. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.